Uh, greetings. Uh, this is Duran Apalian uh, from the University of California, Irvine. It is my pleasure to present a, a retrospective as well as a prospective view of high entropy alloys. Let me share my screen and we get started with the presentation. My co-authors on this uh, presentation are Dr. Ben McDonald, who's a postdoc with us at UCI, uh, Dr. Cheng Zhang, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Enrique Lavernia. We thought it'd be best to present this uh, in four sections. The first one would be a, uh, an understanding of our of HEAs. Some of you are coming to this presentation who may not have been working in the field, so it'd be important for us to set the groundwork and also present how the field has evolved over over the last fifteen years or so, and um, then look at specific systems, uh, prototypical microstructures to really get an understanding of the mechanistic uh, opportunities uh, for designing uh, uh, materials through the HA concepts uh, and focus on the emerging role of interfacial phenomena in on HA stability. Lastly, we'll close with a few comments uh, going forward. So let's get started with the evolving uh, view of the field. You will notice on the left, the number of uh, publications that have, uh, uh, that we have uh, over the last 15 years or so, you'll see the explosion of uh, the number of papers. It was first really come into being in 2004 by a paper by Brian Cantor and his team a titled Microstructural Development of Inequiatomic Multi-Component Alloys. They use the term equiatomic multi-component. And the same year, uh, J.W. Uh, Ye out of Taiwan uh, published a paper uh, using the terms multiple principal elements, but he also coined high entropy alloy, the term high entropy alloy. Since then, we have numerous number of uh, conferences, books, and a lot of publications. So you can see the explosion of the field. Uh, also, it's important to note here that um, the applications for uh, high entropy alloys are, you have quite a few of them, structural as well as functional materials. But when you look at the list of the applications, it's a almost a universal uh, application uh, uh, list. The point to make here is that it, we shouldn't be thinking about HEAs as a material class, but rather uh, the paradigm by which we can design uh, materials. It's a new design approach. And I think that's the way to think about it. Uh, the background of the first uh, well-reported explorations of this compositional space really came about by uh, Brian Cantor and his team at Oxford, where the goal of the early HEA research was as stated there, to investigate the unexplored central region of multi-component alloy phase space. Uh, and uh, you can see here that on the, on, the, on the periodic table, the elements they were focusing it on. Uh, perhaps fortuitous, this alloy that they uh, focused on, the, they, they looked at many, but the one that they ended up focusing on uh, formed a single solid solution FCC phase. Equiatomic, uh, uh, five elements, and they were able to see that it formed a single solid solution FCC phase. Uh, yeah, at the same time, uh, with, the, with the paper in 2004, he looked at a compositional space that's a little different uh, but nevertheless, he also observed that less number of phases were being observed uh, than what was uh, expected by the Gibbs phase rule. Uh, the thing to take away here is that in this uh, HEAs, uh, in this uh, materials that were being uh, observed, uh, alloy systems, there's no uh, solute-solvent uh, distinction. 
the conventional alloys that we have been using for years, you have a dilute solid solution where you have these two atoms, either substitutional in this case or interstitial. Whereas in the high entropy alloys, you have a completely disordered solid solution where the probability of any atom to be on a lattice is the same. So that is the major distinction. Now, in the early days, in 2004 or so, there was this high, uh, the, uh, the hypothesis or uh, that there is a high entropy is the, is the reason why the entropy of mixing increases as the number of components or the constituents increase. Uh, and they have to be at near equiatomic compositions and that they promote solid solutions. So the, uh, uh, you know, the hypothesis that this is really a hypothesis today, but what we need to think about the thermodynamics that led to this, promoting the solid solution phase means that you're minimizing the Gibbs free energy of the solution phase compared to the possible free energy of any intermetallic phases forming. So it's a competition really between the delta G mixing uh, and the delta G formation for all possible phases. The hypothesis was based off an assumption that you are working uh, with an ideal uh, solution phase and, and a perfectly ordered uh, intermetallic which uh, means that the enthalpy of mixing is zero and that the entropy of formation is zero. So the competition really is between the entropy of mixing and the uh, enthalpy of formation. And whichever one is giving the lowest free energy is the one that's gonna be uh, dominant. Another critical assumption is that only entropic contribution uh, from configuration entropy uh, was considered, which allows that the entropy can be represented by the Boltzmann's equation. So these were the, uh, the uh, assumptions that were made. And uh, Gorse, in a uh, very good review in 2018, uh, a couple of years ago, pointed out with this visual that the configurational entropy normalized by the gas constant, plotted as a function of number of components, that if you have two elements, n equal two, three elements, n equal three, seven elements, n equal seven, that the highest configurational entropy occurs where you have an equiatomic amount of the, of the elements. And as you can see here for N2, it's, over, it's here and it moves up along this locus of this point. Uh, The takeaway is what? For a given system, the maximum is at the equiatomic composition. And as more constituents are added, what happens? The entropy increases, okay? Now, the reality, there's always a reality, right? That the, you know, Compositions do not, these HEA compositions do not always act as an ideal solution. Uh, the first XRD plot shows how the Cantor alloy is very special uh, in its ideal solution like behavior. You know, there's a compositional path from nickel uh, to the Cantor alloy that maintains a single FCC phase. Uh, however, with High entropy contributions, some enthalpies of formation outcompete, as you saw from the equation in the previous slide between the delta HF and the delta S mixing. And the micrograph here from Derimov's Der work shows uh, a six element HEA containing a, a high number of secondary phases. Uh, Gorse also uh, showed and analyzed over 300 HEA systems. Uh, it was a very good review compiling the data from these uh, many systems from the literature. And the bar chart shows for five element systems that while some exhibit single FCC or BCC phases, a majority achieve multi-phase microstructures and that six plus uh, even more dominated by multi-phase uh, states, as you can see here. 
Uh, this plot here also demonstrates that it isn't about entropy. It's not about entropy. Most of the multi-phase compositions have a higher calculated entropy term. These are all the non-HEAs, as you can see here. Moreover, entropy scales with temperature. Uh, and if you look at the Cantor alloy, uh, after almost a year and a half, uh, aging at 700 degrees centigrade, you begin to see the composition at, at these intermediate temperatures. So our current understanding of HEAs is that uh, single radium solution phases are rare and entropy alone does not control uh, phase stability. Uh, I think the opportunity here is the region of the phase diagram where we normally have not worked in. It's not the corners where you have a solvent and a solute, but rather in the central region, the equatomic HA is right there in the center with red, but this region that's in green is a vast uh, region in the uh, diagram where uh, essentially it's a opportunities for investigation, discovery, and uh, potential applications. Some words on the nomenclature because it can be confusing for someone who's coming into the field uh, for the first time. Yes, indeed. At the early days, uh, high entropy alloy was the term used and came multi-principle element alloy, but this doesn't really talk about the concentration of the elements. This could very easily apply to a super alloy. I think the field is now gravitated towards complex concentrated alloys as the term to be used, where obviously it's complex and you've got, you know, not uh, dilute uh, uh, amounts, but a concentrated uh, alloys. Hopefully with that background, we can now move into some very specific systems and looking and, and to look at some of the uh, mechanisms uh, uh, that have been uh, 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 discovered and uh, brought understanding to these uh, materials, these alloy systems. If one looks at the very well-known uh, Ashby diagram of fracture toughness as a function of yield strength uh, from uh, Georgia's uh, uh, nature review of materials in 2019, a recent uh, uh, article. You'll see here the Cantor alloys, the uh, right there, with terrific uh, fracture toughness, very uh, respectable fracture toughness values and yield strengths, but also some of the alloys based on the Cantor alloy that have been further opt optimized. Interesting to note that it's very close right there with the cryogenic steels. And we do know about stainless steels, uh, duplex stainless steels and their cryogenic uh, behavior. And I'll come back to that in a, in a minute or so. Uh, uh, Glotovats uh, and his team reported on the deformation mechanisms of this alloy. Uh, and found at room temperature, the alloy deformed by dislocation motion indicated by the significant grain misorientation that you see in the micrograph here, uh, observed by EBSD. We're talking about the Cantor alloy. Uh, furthermore, um, at cryogenic temperatures, uh, the deformed material exhibits a pronounced uh, nano twinning as you see here, not the dislocation motion as you saw there, and this enhanced its ductility. This was further explored by Okamoto and his colleagues through single crystal micro compression of the Cantor alloy. They found that the stacking fold energy is low compared to pure FCC metals, such as aluminum, uh, nickel, et cetera, but not compared to certain binaries of copper and aluminum. More importantly, uh, the shear modulus of the Cantor alloy is fairly high. Uh, you see here 
uh, which leads, uh, and all this leads to a larger separation of partial dislocations for room temperature behavior. When the investigators uh, determined the critical resolved shear stress, they found that for the cantor alloy, it is a order of magnitude higher uh, than pure nickel. And I wanna point to you here, pure nickel has a stacking fold energy 125, almost uh, uh, four times higher than the cantor alloy. But, uh, but the um, uh, shear modulus is, is uh, very near the cantor alloy. So when the magnitude is higher than that of pure nickel in this critical resolved shear stress, this means that the stress required to activate twinning in a tension test is low and twinning is activated during the entire plastic deformation of the cantor alloy at cryogenic temperatures. So an important question uh, asked by the field, is the cantor alloy special because of the sheer number of elements or the cantor alloy is special because of uh, uh, you know subsystem of the alloy would achieve improved properties. In other words, should we be optimizing it? Is this, uh, in other words, lots of opportunity for investigation. And in fact, good of us did exactly that. Uh, where you see here on the left, uh, uh, cryogenic uh, tensile test on the ternary, uh, the cantor alloy and an equiatomic ternary cobalt chromium nickel. Again, quantifying the stacking fold energy, the cobalt chromium nickel was found to have 25% lower stacking fold energy than the cantor alloy. Uh, furthermore, Laplanche and others did extensive uh, transmission microscopy uh, to show that the uh, transformation uh, uh, twinning uh, induced plasticity was activated at room temperature. You'll see here the Shockley partial separation and the stacking fold energies that they measured. In the previous slide by Okamoto, I think it was 30, whereas here there's a range between 18 and 26, a bit lower. Uh, but nevertheless, you see here at room temperatures, uh, uh, the uh, behavior of the material with such a low stacking fault energy. More recent work by Andy Miner's group, uh, this is May 2020, uh, they took a deep dive and overlooked phenomena in this alloy, which is short range order. Uh, they implemented a uh, energy filter TM technique, an advanced technique to characterize uh, samples of the chromium cobalt nickel uh, alloy. But in this case, they looked at the kinetics. Uh, one, it was water quench, meaning very high cooling rates, and then furnace schooled, which is obviously lower cooling rates. And uh, by comparing samples by the cooling rate, they observed that the slowly cooling uh, induced short range order in this case. Uh, and this short range order has a significant impact on the stacking fault energy. You'll see it here. Uh, they also did a great deal of nano indentation work. I don't think I have the time here to really go into it in detail, but very, very good work. But what this did is provide uh, further evidence of the short range order hardening and the subsequent glide plane softening caused by passage of the first uh, few dislocations in the slip band. Uh, so kinetics really, really come into play and much more work is, needs to be done in this, in this area. Another example of the FCC based derivatives of the cantor alloy are the TRIP HEAs, including the system of varying the iron uh, and manganese to promote TRIP deformation, very similar to what we see in steels. So 
Going from left to right, we're increasing the iron content. And going from left to right, we're decreasing the manganese from 45% to 30%. And going from left to right, we're also decreasing the stacking fault energy. Uh, you'll see here with 30% manganese, uh, we have uh, a dual phase of FCC and HCP. Uh, the mechanical behavior is shown here on the far right, the composition with a 30% manganese alloy compared to the Cantor alloy and the EBSD of the interrupted tensile testing at different levels of deformation to capture deformation induced uh, transformation. Another very, very interesting result. This is, as I said earlier, I think, very, very similar behavior to trip and twip steels. So the similarities between the Cantor alloy system and steels is summarized here. Uh, we, we will see a summary of FCC-based HEAs surrounding the Cantor system. And uh, as I said, as to how similar these uh, are to steels. Uh, so these are the ma we're mapping here the common steel constituents, uh, mapping other steel con constituents to the periodic table, uh, and mapping the Cantor alloy. So given the similarities, it is not surprising to see steels exhibiting similar behavior. A paper on the cryogenic behavior of stainless steels, just like the Cantor alloy, and a paper on uh, manganese additions to control trip behavior in steels also appeared in the literature recently, validating that the HEA is really not a new class of materials, but opens up the opportunity for designing uh, materials, engineering, engineering materials by these new paradigms. We really should be talking also about our uh, refractory uh, high entropy alloys because the explosion in the field that you saw earlier on in my presentation where between 2000, especially the last three years, the number of papers, much of that is populated by refractory high entropy alloys. Uh, and uh, the upper left here uh, shows newly reported RHEA compositions as a function of time. And uh, looking back to the overall HEA trend, uh, these RHEAs have really emerged uh, quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, we should look, really look at two subgroups here. The first one here in the blue is, uh, uh, these are uh, refractory high entropy alloys uh, that have high melting point uh, constituents like moly, uh, niobium, uh, uh, tantalum, uh, tungsten. Whereas the, uh, in this one here, the yellow one, these are refractory high entropy alloys that contain the subgroup four elements like hafnium, uh, uh, zirconium, uh, uh, titanium. Um, so as seen at room temperature compression curves, the, these two materials behave very differently. Uh, the one in the black here is corresponding to the yellow uh, domain, tantalum, niobium, hafnium, zirconium, titanium. Look at the extent of uh, ductility that the material uh, demonstrates versus the ones that are in the blue here. Uh, this is just an offset so that they're not overlapping on each other. Uh, so the big, big difference. Uh, uh, the, highlighting these uh, two compositions demonstrate uh, the two goals that the refractory high entropy alloy uh, design achieving uh, good hot strength uh, at higher temperatures and achieving good formability and ductility, depending what the, what the uh, conditions uh, scenario call for. Uh, we should also look at the equiatomic moly, uh, niobium, tantalum, uh, vanadium, tungsten system that Oleg Senkov and his colleagues uh, have reported extensively on where um, uh, this material maintains, uh, this is uh, arc melted, uh, vacuum arc melted. Uh, you can see the structure. Uh, uh, it's a single BCC solid solution uh, phase upon casting. 
And here you'll see the material maintaining strength up to 1200 degrees centigrade in this compression test. Now, when we compare these to well-known uh, alloy systems like Inconel 718 or MARM M247, plotting it as a function of yield strength to temperature, uh, the Inconel is right here. You'll see that right around 800, 750 or so, the, the yield strength drops dramatically. And similarly for MARM 247, uh, whereas these BCC solid solution, single phase solid solution phases, uh, the moly, niobium, tantalum, tungsten, and as well as vanadium, uh, show a great deal of promise where they're maintaining their yield strength at temperatures at 1500 degrees centigrade. And I want to remind ourselves that these are not optimized yet. Uh, looking at the uh, group 4B, the hafnium, niobium, ta uh, uh, tantalum, titanium, zirconium system, this is another side of the RHEAs uh, with mainly subgroup four elements, uh, which also possess a single BCC phase above a thousand degrees centigrade. But they exhibit the composition at intermediate temperatures, uh, uh, secondary BCC phase. Uh, they're also interesting in that uh, in the single phase state, it is highly malleable enough to cold roll at room temperature. This means that tensile samples can be prepared and from the post-deformation annealing treatments, uh, we see exceptional tensile strength with appreciable uh, ductil ductility achieved. Uh, this ductility has been related to uh, the valence electron concentration, VEC, uh, of the alloy. And the field has generally observed higher ductility in BCC-based uh, refractory high entropy alloys containing the subgroup four elements. So the similarities also exist between RHEAs and conventional alloys. Uh, uh, this is a summary slide for the RHEAs here where we're mapping up the major constituents, uh, the refractory alloys for high strength applications and the titanium alloys based on valence electron configuration for ductility. And again, it's a design approach coming at the same problem from different directions. Now let's change gears and look at the emerging role of interfacial phenomena on HA stability. You could add, uh, I think by looking at this, uh, uh, schematic diagram, one can note the interfaces in the volume and see that the variability in energetics along the interfacial sites is much higher than conventional alloys with contributions from nearest neighbor uh, atoms. So the opportunity for interfacial engineering, if you want to call it that, the opportunity for understanding the fundamentals of how the interface uh, comes into play is critical. And in fact, it is it was the nucleus for uh, the MERSEC, uh, uh, formation of the MERSEC here at UCI. Uh, before I dive into it, let me just give you one single case study. And this is work from my uh, co-authors here. Uh, Ben McDonald and, uh, and uh, Zhang. Uh, this is an example of some of the early data that have been gotten that captures just how unique interfacial phenomena are in high entropy alloys. Uh, here, they, uh, the team synthesized a non equiatomic, non equiatomic cobalt, copper, iron, manganese, nickel, HEA and process the material by high pressure torsion, as you see here, to achieve a nanocrystalline structure. Uh, the, the orientation can be seen here, uh, done by an automated crystal orientation mapping, uh, indexing material by uh, electron diffraction and scanning uh, technique. This is very similar to EBSD. Uh, but on a much small, smaller scale, as you can see, 500 nanometers. 
And uh, we can also see here uh, the, uh, the, the interfaces forming. Uh, so the alloy can be uh, homogenized here to, for, to achieve a single FCC phase that persists through the severe plastic deformation of, uh, of this alloy. Now, the heat treatment that was uh, carried out induces phase decomposition in this material, which is common in 3D transition metal HEAs. The upper left here is a CalFAT equilibrium step diagram uh, predicting uh, phase stability in the material and the amount of phases as a function of temperature. Uh, what we see in this prediction that at intermediate temperatures, uh, the emergence of an iron cobalt rich B2 phase and a copper rich secondary FCC phase. But at, uh, after heat treatment at 400 degrees centigrade, the formation of B2 phase is confirmed by uh, stem automated crystal orientation mapping and elemental segregation was first seen with low loss energy filter TM. However, the really interesting behavior of the grain boundaries was appreciated by APT work that was conducted at uh, KIT. Uh, and from the APT of the 400 degree C heat treatment uh, material, uh, the copper rich FCC phase was identified as well as the iron cobalt B2 phase. Uh, you see here uh, the black line and corresponding uh, uh, the segregation that we're seeing here on the right. What I'd like to do here is really point out that by uh, probing the segregation at different grain boundaries in the material, uh, it was discovered that each of these grain boundaries exhibit significantly different compositions. Uh, grain boundary one, here, you'll see uh, nickel and copper uh, segregation. At grain boundary two, it's mostly nickel. At grain boundary three, it's mostly uh, manganese and nickel. This is showing that interfacial phenomena are highly dependent on the local chemistry at each type of interface, you know, depending on what kind of grain boundary character it has. And more specifically, uh, at each atomic site in the boundary. Uh, work, you know, this, this work really motivated really our, uh, the need for, uh, as I said earlier, the pivotal role that interfaces can play. Now, if you look at conventional alloys, gulliver shot equation, segregation, and compare to this, it's a completely new paradigm. This is segregation and interfacial, uh, boundaries at a whole different dimension. I want to thank uh, our colleague Horst Hahn at KIT and Lakshmi for uh, their uh, collaboration on the, on the APT work that I just showed. About the MERSEC at uh, UCI, uh, uh, taking off from what I just said, our focus is really to develop a foundational interfacial science, not only for metals, but also ceramics, complex concentrated materials to predict the atomic level structure and chemistry, thermodynamics, kinetics, and properties. It's a major challenge. Uh, the challenge is really to develop the fundamental interfacial science. Uh, the website is here. A lot more information is, is provided there. Uh, the approach that we're taking uh, with our uh, research group uh, one, which is led by Tim Rupert, uh, Shashin Pan is the director of the MERSEC at UCI, and Tim Rupert is leading the uh, uh, IRG1, focusing on this. Uh, and as you can see from this, we're looking at obviously processing, uh, characterization, behavior, modeling, you know, the whole, the whole uh, ball of wax. The team consists of, it's a very collaborative team, uh, as you would expect in the MERSEC, uh, very interdisciplinary and Half of the uh, researchers uh, are uh, less than 10 years uh, from their PhD. So uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful mix of uh, remarkable people uh, uh, working together. And you'll hear a lot more from us in the near future. In closing, uh, future directions. Uh, 
as uh, Dan Miracle, uh, who has done so much in the, in the field as well, I've already pointed out some of the prominent authors here, uh, Oleg Senko, Miracle, and others. Uh, the future of HEA research is really about ex exploring the vast compositional space. It's, as I said earlier, this, this vast area. Uh, well, to, to achieve this large effort, uh, you know, you can't do this by an Edisonian approach. Uh, you got, <laughs> if you look at the number of uh, potential alloy systems, uh, it is uh, not manageable. You can certainly not do that as for So what we need are, are some screening uh, techniques, high throughput techniques. And we're uh, fortunate that the field also has some wonderful investigators uh, looking into this. One technique is the high throughput uh, technique by using sputtering, co-sputtering, where the sample, uh, the, the, the target is, is shown here and you can see that you can have various different alloy systems. Essentially, uh, very quickly, one can have many, many different alloys uh, prepared on one sample uh, to uh, do the triage, if you will. But I think also a lot of simulation where one can reduce the number of alloy systems from however thousand of number of alloy potential candidates and then uh, make the samples by this technique. Another technique that also came out of University of Wisconsin are our friends Dan Toma and, and his colleagues, uh, a very interesting paper that appeared in 2019 uh, where they were using, uh, they are using additive manufacturing technique to make a lot of different samples uh, for high throughput uh, analysis. So in closing, uh, the way I've been, I've been uh, planting some seeds that really we need to think about HEAs as a new paradigm to design materials. And I think this visual by, from George's uh, nature paper really puts it all together. Uh, it's almost uh, very similar to uh, Greg Olson's uh, process diagrams uh, that we've seen in, in design of materials where we're focusing on the uh, mechanistic high entropy alloy design coming in from a variety of different uh, perspectives, mechanistic design, effects, high entropy alloy design. That's all about uh, this new uh, uh, approach to design materials. Uh, lastly, it would be nice to have a comprehensive uh, alloy database. I know that Dan, Dan Miracle has also talked about this. Uh, there's no need for us to work in silos. Uh, it's important for us to work together uh, and learn from each other as we're doing here at these uh, platforms at TMS and other forums. Uh, and it's also important for us to not only share all the wonderful, great, amazing results but also the failures. We learn from failures. Let's include our unfavorable results as well uh, because I think we can learn from them. Uh, in, in closing, uh, uh, just to summarize, entropy alone does not control phase stability. We've just opened the door to a vast compositional space. So lots of opportunities and I think you know I'm biased here that the interfacial phenomena in HAs are complex and we're working on that. And lastly, that a mechanistic design approach based on prototypical microsectors are going to enable us to have many, many HA applications. I want to thank you for your attention uh, and look very much, very much forward to being at TMS meeting where we're not doing this by Zoom and we're together, we can have a glass of wine together, see each other, and maybe even be able to give hugs to each other. I don't know. I, hopefully that day will come. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I will stop here and uh, stop the uh, presentation. Thank you.